You're going to learn a little bit about sunset painting today with my guest, Howard Friedland. Howard, welcome. Thanks. It's great to be with you. It's This is day number 302. We missed you guys. We took yesterday off because everybody wanted to see the inauguration. So uh, here we are, uh, day number 302 with Howard Friedland. And Howard, tell me what you're going to do for us today. Well, I'm going to be uh, painting on a painting that I had started already. It's a sunset scene and a small study. Uh, so I'll be trying to get it to a little bit more of a finish. That's good, because we oftentimes get to watch a painting get started, but we oftentimes don't get to see how a painting is finished, and that's going to be really valuable. You and I have something very special in common, and that is that when I did the first Publishers Invitational, before, uh, it, actually before it became really anything, uh, you, you and Susan were part of that. That was a wonderful trip. We really enjoyed it, and we got to know you a little bit better, and yeah. uh, and a lot of the other artists that you had invited. That was was a lot of fun and uh, terrific. It was at the Wizard Academy in Austin. That's right. And so what yeah. what happened? Just to explain to everybody, is I had been at uh, some plein air event somewhere, and I was sitting around the table with a bunch of artists, and they were kind of lamenting the the idea that they never get to paint together because when they're out at events, they you know they want to sell a painting. So if they set up next to somebody and do the same scene, it's not necessarily very healthy. And so they're, and they're always busy. They don't get to hang out together very much. And so I thought, well, why don't I start this thing and uh, I'll get a bunch of artists together. So I invited, I think I invited seven artists and then those seven, some of them said, Hey, can I bring so-and-so along? And, and anyway, Howard and Susan were part of the original and that's why it, it had the name Publishers Invitational because it was by invitation only at the time. Uh, let's see who. Let's try to remember who was there. You were there, Susan Blackwood. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Leg was there. Jeff Leg, Carolyn oh, Anderson. Carolyn Todd got Williams. sick. Yeah. Who? Todd Williams. Uh, Todd Williams. Yeah. Uh, John Lasseter. John Lasseter, yeah. right? Um, the Dairy Berries. Oh, Jerry and Jer Jerry, Jerry and Jeannie yeah. Dairy Berry. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, let's see who else. You come up with some. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> uh, uh, Peter Miller. Yeah, was Louis Escobedo there? Yeah, Louis was there. Louis, yeah. I remember Peter Miller. Uh, Jeff Peter Lake, Miller. Yeah. And we we found out that Jeff loves to do portraits. Yeah. And that we did. A, a, I don't know if you remember this, but we did portraits by candlelight. Yeah. Because we didn't have any. We were out on the outdoors and we didn't have any lights. <laughs> yeah. I think Tammy Cowens was there too. She was. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I'm trying to think of who else. Good I got a good memory for those things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure somebody will chime in and say, hey, I was there. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to leave well, anybody out. Well, uh, listen, I, I, I want to go ahead and get right into painting because I'm, I'm curious about this. I do want to tell you some big news, a couple of big things. Number one, Howard, uh, I just got an email. I just posted this on Facebook a few minutes ago. Uh, Plein Air Podcast was named the number one painting podcast in the world by right. uh, Feedspot. And so that's pretty cool. They, they sent me a note, said, hey, you're in the top 15. And I looked and we were number one. So that was pretty cool. Um, also, yesterday, uh, we, we announced we're going to do a new kind of workshop called the SOAR Workshops, which is uh, accelerated learning tools that we've developed and, and worked with others on. And uh, we just announced the first one, which is going to be Bill Davidson. So that's cool. And uh, so got more stuff to talk about later. But right count now. Count me and I'd be interested. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, in doing one. In doing one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll talk. That's a great idea. Because <laughs> I've been teaching Zoom classes. So I have all, I have like four cameras that I have going with different things. I'll talk all about that while I'm painting. All right. But, uh, well, we have, we have a whole, different, we got, we'll talk. Well, we've got, we're doing them in studio in our in our soundstage. Oh, so you would have to come here, but that's okay. We'd love to have you. I'd okay, because we're all going to be free soon. You know, we know that. So yeah, we hope. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Let's get to painting. Let's okay. do that. So what I've got here, I'm going to switch cameras for so you can see my um, my painting and right. the palette. Now the palette I'm using is not. Um, I'll show you my regular palette and I'm using a vertical palette so you can see my mixing as well, but I didn't want to put my, my blobs of paint on that palette. I didn't want it sliding down because I'm using it vertically. 
So let me switch over to that. Okay. Here we go. Hey, you guys, by the way, uh, just while Howard's switching the painting over, I just mentioned to the, today that I gave away a whole bunch of prizes, and I'll announce who the prize winners are soon, but you can win prizes. Today's prize will be a plein air uh, magazine apron, and uh, we'll be giving that away. So uh, make sure you're leaving comments uh, in the comments section. Tell us where you're from, too, if you can. Okay, Howard, you're on. Okay. So um, now that I've switched cameras, I just wanted to show you what I'm painting as far as the reference goes. I'll just hold it up here as a, a printout of a sunset that I took in Montana uh, when I lived there from uh, an area that we used to walk our dogs. It's a, a hill. And um, so I'll be painting that. The other thing I wanted to show is uh, my palette, which is... I'll hold it up. I'll be using, these are the paints uh, that I'll be working with. And then what I'm going to do, so you'll be able to see some of my mixtures. Once I get the paint on here, I'll be mixing it right here. So you'll be able to see, this is, uh, this is one of those Edge Pro Minis, which is kind of convenient because you can uh, have your palette on the side and you can have your painting right next to it. And so... Now, talk about paint sliding off. This is the first anybody's done a, a vertical palette on this show in 302 mm -hmm. days. I, I'll be honest with you. I've never used a vertical palette before, but for this, for the purposes of this, I wanted people to be able to see me mix colors rather than just okay. uh, as a teaching experience. All right. So, well, I will tell you that, that I, I do it once in a while, and um, it just it depends on how much oil is in your paint before you get drippy, but usually it'll yeah. kind of hang there. Yeah, this is a glass palette, so yeah. I didn't want to take a chance of uh, everything falling falling down. Yeah. <clears throat> so the first thing I, I do when I have a painting that I've already started, uh, if it's still wet, like if I'm working on it the next day, I, I normally take some of the thicker paint off and I just use a palette knife and, you know, I may just skim skim some of the thicker paint off, not enough to take it all off. You, you'll still see um, the color that's there. But I, I want to keep the, the surface of the canvas as dry and tacky as possible so that whatever new mixtures I add to the painting, uh, I can control a little bit better. Okay, so um, tell us what you painted on here. Okay, um, this studies, this is just a Centurion uh, uh, commercially made uh, canvas board. It's okay. linen uh, on a board. I like the Centurions, I just like the you know, the smooth texture of, of the linen and it, it takes paint well. I very often make my own panels and I have a, a little video that I made uh, that's available um, just on how to make panels. It's a very easy process, um, but um, just for my classes, I, I'm just using the Centurion boards. So. Okay. Uh, I see certain things that I'm going to want to change. Uh, I need to adjust some values. I, I want to start getting some of the sunset to, to pop out a little bit more. So now that I, I've knocked off some of the thicker, the thicker paint. Now this, is, this painting was done uh, Monday. So the paint is really set up. So um, I can... I think it'll be a nice surface to work on. Now, if a paint, if I leave a painting for a number of days or a week or more and it's dry, then uh, if it's thick paint, I can still scrape it off. But I also want to, uh, what they call rubbing it out, which is just to take a little bit of linseed oil on your fingertips. Uh, on the, It has to be dry though just rub it into the surface of the painting. And that, what that does is it allows you to uh, 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 control your edges a little bit better. Uh, working on a dry surface canvas can 
Uh, you can get some really hard edges. Uh, and in certain places, hard edges are a good thing, but in certain places you want them a little softer or even lost. So by oiling it out, it gives you a little bit better control. It also brings the color back up because certain colors tend to dry matte and certain colors will dry a little bit more. Uh, so when you put on the oil, it just evens the, the, the color out. Okay. So well, what I'll do now is I'm uh, gonna use, and, and I know Eric, you have these red glasses. Uh, or they're not red. Yours, I don't know if yours are red, but they're value checkers. Yeah, mine are mine are a little deeper uh, tone than those. Those those are a little bit pink, from what I could tell. Yeah, these are kind of red, and they come. What what it does is uh, it cuts the color, and you, all you see are the values. So what I want to do before I begin is to check back and forth with my photo reference and my painting. I can look back and forth to check and make sure that the values are working. And if not, that's the first thing that I want to uh, approach. So I see that I could use a lot more contrast between the, uh, the foreground trees and, and land and, and the sky. Things seem to be pretty close in value. So I'm gonna take a Let's see, medium-sized brush. Let me get my water over here so I don't dip my brush in it. Well, they always say don't drink water and, and where you're painting because you might drink <laughs> turpentine. Yeah, I'll just move that over. So, um, so what I'm going to do? Squint and maybe darken. So I'm, right here, I'm using a little bit of, uh, this is Van Dyke Brown. It's a real dark. And I'll, I'm going to put a dark note right where I see it, the darkest would be under this tree. Now, this notice how Howard is holding his brush, how far back he's holding it. Yeah. That already starts to get me a little bit of some contrast going. Let's see. And then some of these bushes along here, you won't be able to see because there's only, in my classes, I'm able to have four cameras in my Zoom classes because I want everybody to be able to see the palette. They want to see the demo. They want to see the reference so they can see what I'm doing exactly. So as I start moving up, up this tree, I'm going to go a little bit lighter and a little bit more, a little bit more chroma. In other words, a little greener. Because when, when you're photographing something like a sunset, you, if you expose for the land or the darks, then what happens is all your light colors in the sky tend to get uh, washed out. If you expose for the sky, then all your darks go black. But you have to know what the local color is of the object that you're painting so that you have some influence of that color. Can you tell people what local color is? What's that mean? Yeah. So color has four aspects to it. The hue, the value, the temperature, and the chroma. All those things go into any color. And all color is relative. So the hue is just the name of the color, uh, the, the name of the color of the object. And that's called a local color. That's the definition of a local color is really the color of something before it's under the influence of light and shadow. Okay, so out of so the tube. Yeah, so you lo the local color, the second part would be the value, and that's how light or dark, darker version of it, of that color is it. And that's all relative and it's all comparative. So now you're laying down a green that's cooler. Yeah, I'm gonna go up 
a little bit warmer. What, what's happening in this scene is that the land is being influenced by the color. The sky is the light source. It's always the light source. If it's a sunny day, then it's a sunny light source. So you'll have warm light. And then you, that means you'll have cool shadows. If you have cool light, like skylight, blue light, your shadows are going to be warmer. So it's all a matter of uh, comparing. One will be warm, one will be cool. One of the examples I give is if I'm painting a, a red barn uh, and the sun is hitting one side of the barn, that red will lean a little bit more towards the warmer reds, towards the orangier side of the color wheel. And in the shadows, it'll lean a little bit more towards the red violet or the alizarin type of thing. Okay. So that's so the so that's the next thing. After the after the values, we have color temperature of a color, the temperature of that color. So that has to do with the light source. So the angle of the light and the quality of the light will tell you uh, whether it's warm or cool. So if the warm uh, the quality is a warm light, it'll it'll warm up. There's a question that says, do the glasses help indoors? Yes. Yeah, they help indoors. <clears throat> so then I will, I always, when I start with, with a painting, I usually go from dark to light. And the reason for that is when I'm starting on a white canvas, for instance, if I start with the lights, I'm competing with the white of the canvas and I can't really judge because everything in painting is, is relative. Oh, I'm mixing down. I'm forget to, forgetting to mix up here. Um, so the colors that are up here in the sky are going to end up somewhere on the land because it influences the colors in the land. All right. Because that's the light source. Hmm. So then, so that's color temperature. And then the fourth part of a color is the chroma. And that is the brilliance or the brightness or the purity of a color. So the colors right out of the tube, the cadmium colors are your purest colors and, and, and the blues, they're all pure. Now, um, the function of chroma is to get the feeling uh, or the uh, experience of, of uh, this space and distance. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yep. So something, let's say if you had this red barn we're talking about, if I'm standing 20 feet away from the barn and painting it, and it's a pretty bright red, I can go pretty bright with it. But if I walk 100 yards back and I can still see that barn and the barn is still in my painting, I want to uh, take some of the, the power out of that red. I want to use either a uh, complementary color like a, a little touch of green or some cooler color to take some of the intensity or chroma out so it sits back in the background. So you want to, you're trying to make it look further back. Yeah, because it, you know, I, I've walked 100 feet away, it is further back now mm -hmm. or, or 100 yards away, right? You yep. want it to sit back in the background. You have your foreground, your middle ground, and your background. If you're painting the bond in the foreground, you can go a little bit with a little bit more chroma, but that same barn a uh, hundred feet away uh, or a hundred yards away, if you make it the same color as you painted it in the foreground, it's going to jump forward to that foreground plane. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So that's the chroma. So those four things, the hue, the value, the temperature and the chroma, and it's all relative. So when I put a color down, what I'm asking myself is, is it lighter, darker, warmer, cooler, brighter, or duller to make it work for the area that I'm painting? So I'll put something down and I'll step back and I'll look at it and I'll say, that needs to be lighter or darker or warmer, cooler, brighter, or duller. Okay. So that's basically my thinking of, of what, what I'm doing here. The other thing is I'm concerned about shapes creating an interesting connection of darks. Connect, try, trying to connect them. I'm not exactly copying 
um, what I see in the reference material. I'm using it as a model, and I'm trying to design. Will you tell us why you want to connect your darks? I want to connect them because it's a better, it's, it makes for better design. Simplifying. That's a very important part of design. Simplify things. The two things that I think are the most important thing in painting that I strive for are variety and unity. Variety of shapes, colors, values, um, <clears throat> edges. That people crave variety in their lives. And the other thing is unity. They also create a certain feeling of unity and balance and connectivity. So those two things I strive for to, to create in my paintings. It's kind of interesting to to try to concentrate on painting and, and talking at the same time, but I'll, you know. I'll try to do my best. But uh, so I put those darks down there. Now I want to start maybe to see. Now, the theme of this painting is orange and blue. There are other colors, browns and things like that, but it's basically an orange and blue painting. So to get get some of these colors, I'm going to re and this goes back to harmony and unity. I'm going to try to basically use orange and blue. Now the blues will lean a little bit, a little bit towards the violets. They'll lean either way. And the oranges will lean a little bit towards the reds and the yellows, because those are the colors that, that make up orange. <clears throat> and, um, so let me see. I think I'm gonna. Hey, I wanna say hi to everybody. We've got people from uh, Sweden, from uh, South Africa. Um, let's see, I saw India. Thank you guys for tuning in. So what are you what are you doing now? Well, I see a little bit. I, I'm adding a little lighter, and I'm adding some blue into where the sky is as a contrast. Okay. Do you put any medium in your paint? Um, not at this point. I I can sometimes I will use. Um, some of the gambling products like Neo McGill or the uh, non-solvent gel. Uh, Do you, when you, when you did your first painting, did you paint real thin? Did you paint with a Gamsol or something underneath or did you just paint right out of the tube? I just, well, no, when I first start, I, that's when I would be using some of the medium because sometimes if the, um, if the canvas is absorbent, the paint won't flow the way I want it to flow. So sometimes I'll add some of that medium. I won't, I'm not using any medium now because the surface of the painting is kind of tacked up already. And, oh, uh, let's see. So it's really taking the paint well. I don't, it's not absorbent anymore because it has a layer of, of paint on it. Okay. So I'm just mixing a little bit of uh, see red orange. Okay. Hello Tunisia and hello Pakistan. Now you, I noticed you put a little white into that. <clears throat> Doesn't that cool it down? It will, but um, it's warm enough. It's everything again is relative. So if, if that's true, if you lighten something with white, you're also cool cooling it a little bit. So if you want it to stay warm, you, you need to put a little of some warm color into some yellow, orange, or red, something to warm it back up again. Uh, but again, there's no such thing as a color by itself. It just doesn't exist. Joseph Albers was a 
a teacher at Yale University who did color studies with his students. And he has this book out. If you've ever... If, I, if you ever I have it. Exercise. It's right here on my bookshelf. Yep. And if you look at those color exercises, it's proof that you can have the same color, put it next to another color, and it'll look completely different. Mm -hmm. So that what that proves is uh, a color by itself doesn't exist. It's always compared to what? Yeah, that's when CW was on the other day. He said it's all about relationships. Absolutely. Color relationships. My hand is really shaking. I must be nervous. But You drank um, too much coffee this morning, that's all. Yeah. It's just trying to think and, and talk at the same time. <laughs> but, you know, this nervous hand, that's what's called impressionism. Yeah. So uh, when you're painting a, a, a sunset in plein air, you know, the, the afternoon light, the sunset light lasts about, what, three minutes, five minutes, tops? Yeah. How, how do you do it? What, what's your process like? So the thing is, if you're going to paint a sunset outdoors, you have to be prepared. You have to set up well before the, the golden hour or the, the time that you're expecting the sunset. Well before, you have to have your canvas prepared, you have to have your palette out, you have to have your brush ready, everything, and then paint like mad and work small because um, just to get your canvas covered. Um, and if you could even block in some of it, not the sky probably, but if there's some land in there, you could probably block it in. You're going to be changing it as the light changes, obviously, but at least get your composition going. Uh, of what you what you're gonna want and then you know even six by eights just to get you're not going to get a finished painting anyway when unless you're in some sort of painting competition where um, uh, so what I'm doing now is um, what I was talking about variety I want to get variety of shapes I, I don't want to and then Variety and then repetition is another design element which has to do with um, let me now can you talk about repetition what what the right thing and the wrong thing to do are? If yeah, the, the thing the thing too is that if you if you have one thing in a painting, uh, it's boring. If you have two things, it's boring. Three things is is better, and the shapes and sizes should be different. And there's something called Papa Mama Baby. <clears throat> so if you know the big shape. So these two trees, for instance, um, I wouldn't want them the same size or shape. Uh, I want to get some variety in that. But repetition comes, comes uh, into play with, vari with uh, getting variety. Papa, mama, baby. Yep. Yeah, uh, Charles White always used to say, say, be careful about having soldiers lined up in a row. You know, people would line up their trees, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they were all the same height. And, and so, you know, break them up, put them in clusters, clusters of three, clusters of two, plus three, that kind of thing. Do you believe that? Yeah, that's the thing is, if you, uh, nature is very random and very more interesting uh, Man-made things tend to, like if you're landscaping, uh, you might see a row of trees that are equally spaced. But in nature, you you rarely see anything like that. Now, what I have here is just a dry brush without any paint on it. And when I'm, I'm just kind of going over it and, and softening some edges. Now, that brush has an angle. Tell us about that brush. Yeah, this is... This, I, I, it's a, called a dagger brush. Uh, it's a rosemary brush, and it's a synthetic, I believe. But it um, 
it's nice because you, you can use it this way. You get a, a nice broad uh, stroke, or you can just use it this way and get a, a linear stroke. So it's a very handy brush to, uh, and there's some, some light coming through these trees. One of the things that is very important when you're doing sky holes is that you don't want the sky hole to be as bright and by bright, I mean chromatic, as the surrounding sky or the, the mass of the sky, because it's against a dark shape. And if you put something as light as this in here, it's going to jump out because it's right next to the dark thing. So if you tone it down a little bit by adding a little of some now, I didn't want that right in the middle, but I'll add another one there. You want it to be able to sit in there. That looks like, now I'll adjust it because that's not bright enough, but. Hey, if you guys are enjoying this, give Howard a, a, some applause with a thumb up or a heart or something. I'm sure he'd appreciate it. Yeah, so every brushstroke you put down has to has to be a thoughtful brushstroke. In other words, think about what would cause a color to to be a particular way, and by that I mean what color is reflecting into it. Uh, now this little see I'm using this dagger brush that's too bright so I'll knock that color knock that color down I'm so used to working on my palette I'm not used to working on this but I thought it would be a good idea we'll forgive you all right well but only this once yeah it's like juggling it's talking Trying to remember to paint on that palette. And, but painting should be fun and it is fun. So these bushes, the tops are being influenced by some of that orange light from the sun. The sun is down here and it's reflecting up underneath these clouds and, and lighting those clouds up. And that's what's causing, let me see, let me try some, some of this color for the tops to kind of, uh, I kind of like this brush because you, you've got a variety of uh, textures and brush strokes. Another thing that I like to use are um, fan brushes because my goal here is to try to make it as natural looking as possible. Yeah, you can't control a fan brush at all. Yeah, I don't oh, want to, yeah. To me, a painting is interesting if the artist, it, it's kind of controlled, um, what, you, what am I trying to say here? It's kind controlled, of- Controlled chaos. Chaos, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, we did a, uh, we did, I went over to Russia back in March and we did a video with the great Russian master, Nikolai Bolkin. Yeah. He so painted, I he painted that entire three or four day portrait with, with a fan brush. It was amazing how he managed to get that controlled chaos. That, that alone is worth watching it for. Absolutely. And to me, when you're doing foliage, especially, um, that's how you get those beautiful textures. Now I want to do. I do want to get um, some uh, difference between the foreground and the texture here down in the foreground because the texture of this foliage is not the same as, as what's going on here. I don't want a lot of texture. It's kind of smoother up there. So um, let me ask you a question because I'm going to take a break here in a second. Uh, what what is the what are the next two or three things you're going to focus on? in the next few minutes 
I'm going to start focusing on the sky colors. Uh, I'm using softer brushes now because, again, I mentioned before that I want to get that uh, variety. I'm going to use a larger brush and just, I want this, at this point in the painting, uh, it's all blocked in and there's minor color ch shifts, but I start really starting to concentrate on, on edges. I, I want, <clears throat> excuse me, I want the texture of the sky to come across as, a, well, a sky, obviously, but um, different than what I have down in here. So now the colors are there. I'm just with a soft brush trying to see subtle nuances of a little bit redder, a little bit yellower. One of the things about painting at sunset, and I think this is very important, um, to get the, the real feeling of the strength of the, uh, of the sun, because everything is relative, you want to kind of gray down everything else around it. So sometimes I'll just put a little a touch of black, which I really don't have on my palette right now, or you know, a strong complement to gray everything down because everything is relative. In order to make something seem really bright, you have to have dull things next to it. Do that again. Everything is relative. So in order to make something seem bright like this, bright and warm, you have to have cool and dull things next to it. Dull, dull things. I'd never heard that. I've heard, I've always, I've heard dark, but. Well, it's always the opposite. So if you want something bright and warm, by bright, I, I mean chromatic, very strong chroma. You want you want to have uh, something that's dull, complement complementary to that, which is dull. The the brighter you want something, like so, paint out of the tube. We're painting with pigments, we're not painting with light. We're trying to get the feeling of light. And the only way we can do that is by manipulating those four things. The hue, well, the three things. The hue is just going to be the color. The sky could be any color, really. But you want to manipulate the temperature, the value, and the chroma to try to create the illusion of light. So by using opposites next to each other, so paint out of the tube can only go so, so bright. But to get it even brighter, you have something next to it that's the opposite. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the game. The game of painting is just the game of manipulating. So it's not just what you're. It's not just what you're seeing. If you want that, if you want that yellow to stand out, then you need the complementary color dulled down next to it. Yeah. And maybe darker. And yeah, well, it, it's a matter of observation. Um, it's not a painting from a photograph. Is not as good as painting from life because your eyes see thousands of times more than a photograph can actually capture, more accu accurate yeah. color. So yeah. painting outdoors in plain air is the best way to go. But if you want to do a sunset, working from uh, photographs 
uh, are convenient because you have a lot more time to manipulate it. But since you're working from a photograph, you don't necessarily want to try to copy what's in the photograph because the photograph doesn't have all the information. Right. That photographs, you have. photographs lie. Yeah. So you have to use your knowledge and imagination and push things push some things to get the feeling that you had when you actually saw. How many times have you seen a, a sunset and grabbed your camera and said, I got to take a picture of this. This is gorgeous. And you look at the picture and it's not anything like what, what you actually saw. Yeah. You know? So you have to learn to interpret photographs. You know, it's interesting. I have a very um, expensive state of the art Sony camera and yet, and, and it's incredible, but I can get better sunset pictures with my iPhone. Yeah. Uh, and it uses a technology that, that, that takes multiple readings and, and, and it's called uh, ADR, which basically combines the reading from the, the sky and from the uh, ground. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And they move too. So I, I out here where we live now in Arkansas, this beautiful, uh, waterfalls and you know things to paint and the new my my phone I don't know what version uh, you might have but with my phone you can loop it so you you have the photo it takes photos of I guess several photos of the shot when you snap it and cool. then it there's motion and then you can loop that motion. So if I'm painting from my phone picture, um, let's see, what am I doing? If I'm painting from my phone picture, I can just have that waterfall continually running and I'm painting from a, like I'm moving. Yeah. Right? Can you, a uh, question from Carol Davis who says, can you talk about the hard and soft edges concerning the sky? Yeah. <clears throat> I want to keep them pretty soft. Um, and dreamy, kind of. Dreamy. I'm just kind of playing with some different cools in the way of blues and violets and adding some reds. That's where the variety I was talking about comes from. <clears throat> I look at one thing and then I look at something else and I say, is that redder or bluer? A color can only be lean one of three ways, red, yellow, or blue. Everything else is just... Uh, Kind of a manifestation of those three colors. So it'll lean redder, yellower, or bluer. And I'll, I'll compare one to the other. That has to be lighter. So I'll, I'll say this is lighter. I'll lighten it a little bit or cool it, blue it. And it's just a matter of playing with the colors until it reads as what you want it to, the feeling that, that you want. This cool against the warm is what I want. And I'll just keep. Not so much to remember. Too much to remember? So you much can't. to remember about cool and warm and complementaries and chromas and grays and take some time. Yeah, it's, it seems like a lot, but it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I think it's just, it's not that much to remember. If you, as long as you remember something is, uh, warmer or cooler than the next thing, or lighter or darker than the next thing, warmer or cooler than the next thing. That's all you have to remember. Yeah. Plus, you know, you have to create an interesting composition. That's a whole other subject. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. Well, maybe but, if we do, maybe if we do a project together, we'll do something on that too. Yeah. Well, hey, there's somebody from Croatia, Zagreb. Oh, Zagreb. I love Welcome Croatia. Boris. 
we, uh, Susan and I have painted in, uh, in Croatia, three, we went three on three separate painting teaching trips. I hear it's Croatia beautiful. Gorgeous. Oh, yeah. What we are you to... dipping your brush in now? Somebody asks. Oh, Charlotte. Blue, it's some sort of blue. I'm trying. And, and it's really uh, to, you know, paint for people. It's not the same as, you know, painting in your own studio because I tend to step back a lot more than. I feel I have time to do. Yeah, it's hard to do. Now, let me ask you this question. Um, what about things that lead the eye out of the painting? For instance, uh, is it, you've, got, you've got the big streak of yellow going across the top. Which, All yeah. right. Yeah, so is, is there something you do that prevent it from leading you out or you're just breaking it up? What, what's, the, what's the thought process there? Okay. Again, everything is relative. So if I have something strong enough here to keep you there, that won't be. Yeah, that's probably not a good idea to have anything pointing to the corner, really. <clears throat> but and you would change. I would change that. That was a good observation. But <clears throat> as long as you have something strong enough to hold the eye, it's a matter of how everything in painting is a matter of how much. You know, my saying is it's not done till it's overdone. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, after I, I, I would want this sunset -y thing to, to somehow come to the other side. I wouldn't want it to end right in here at that, that corner. I want to continue it on somehow. <clears throat> well, you got about five minutes left. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'll get a, get as far along as I can on this. Uh, actually, um, actually, you don't even have five minutes. You got about three minutes, so. Oh, that's good. This went pretty fast. I want but in the next three minutes. I want to give a little plug to my uh, Zoom classes. Um, if you I'll want put your website up on on the screen. Yeah, yeah. I have four cameras where uh, you'll be able to see my my painting demo, you'll be able to see my full palette, which obviously you can't see now, my reference photo, and um, me <laughs> when I'm talking. So people tend to really like them. And I have, have one coming up called painting, uh, a nocturne painting from a daytime or a daylight photograph. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a, a photo that I took during the day and I'm translating it into a night scene. Oh, that'd be fun. That's called a mock, mock turn. A mock turn. Mock turn is a night, night painting. Well, a, a, well, a pretend mock, not a pretend knock turn is a mock turn. M O C K mock turn. A mock turn. This is a mock turn. Yeah. And the more you, you paint on these things, the more you'll, you'll start to see, Maybe maybe some counterpoint. This is such a strong line coming across. You may want to have. You can add add things. The sky and the clouds could pretty much be anything. Um, I'm just using what's here to to use my imagination, and I think this might be the last. The last note I'm putting down. Nice. Now the idea of using thicker paint, it draws the eye a little bit more. Yeah. The, in the, you want thicker paint in the light and thinner paint in the shadows. And the shadows should be a little quieter. I'm using my finger here just to kind of soften some things. So this is bringing your eye down. This, this something here should bring it across to here. Lead lines. This might be a little strong to the edge. Like it's Howard, why don't you come back on camera because we're going to have to say goodbye. Sounds good. Oh, thumbs up and applause for Howard Friedland's painting. That's outstanding. Well, I, hope, I hope you got uh, some decent information out of that. Oh, yeah, that's very helpful. I want to encourage you guys to go to Howard, howardfriedland.com. 
uh, check out his Zoom classes and everything else that he's got going on. And uh, we did. We already found out that one of your Zoom classes is in conflict with Watercolor Live, so you'll just have to pick one or the other. All right, and that's okay if you pick Howard. We 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 support him. <laughs> well, the classes go for three weeks, so. Wow. And also, there's a recording, so you can watch Watercolor Live, and then there's a, a full recording of of the class All that right. I send out to everybody, so they could paint along with it and stop it and do all that kind of good stuff uh, at their leisure uh, in the safety of their own home. Okay. Well, Howard, thank you so much. We'll talk after the broadcast. And, and uh, I want to thank you for doing this today. You've inspired us all. <laughs>